Welcome everyone to Cocktails and Fishtails this lovely October 2020. Uh, we have the lovely Monica here and I'm Stina Troyer, the science specialist with Harbor Wild Watch. And this is my first time leading a Cocktails and Fishtails. And Monica, this is your first time presenting, right? Yes, it is. So, first time for all, for those of you tuning in, hopefully you've, you've watched one of these before. If you haven't, they're all um, stored on our lovely Facebook page. So you can go back and review some past events as well as tune in for this one. So um, we're super excited to have Monica talk uh, more about orca behavior tonight. Um, but first, just a couple little Harbor Wild Watch announcements on my end. Um, <laughs> Rachel and I were out all afternoon filming some exciting salmon content. A lot of it was for our um, upcoming virtual salmon field trips. So if there are students you know or teachers who you think might need some <laughs> or desire some salmon content, um, definitely get in touch with us. We'd be delighted to share that content with you. Um, so you can come learn, have fun uh, over at Donkey Creek and Austin Estuary Parks. Um, for November, we're kind of gearing up uh, for a salmon season since we can't do Chum Fest in person this year where we celebrate the return of the chum salmon. Um, we're kind of just turning it into an all November, all salmon on deck. So we'll have lots of fun salmon content for you um, all throughout November. And of course the cocktails and fish tails presentation then too. But um, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of tonight's presentation. Um, so for those of you who are tuning in, um, I will be monitoring the Facebook chat feed for any questions. Um, and then we'll be um, going over those questions at the end of the presentation. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, we're excited to, you know, there's lots of exciting, wonderful things about orchids. So um, let us know what you're wondering and we'll do our best to make sure that we get that all covered. So um, with that, uh, we do indeed have Monica uh, Whelan Shields here. She's the co-founder and director of the Orca Behavior Institute and uh, she's tuning in from San Juan Island. Uh, I guess that might be one silver lining of not having to do a lot of travel, but we sure wish we could host you uh, here in the South Sound, but she'll be presenting about the complex behaviors of Puget Sound orcas. And she's observed the Southern residents since 2000, becoming known locally for her whale photography and blog, Orca Watcher. Uh, in addition to being interested in acoustics, She's keen to study the changing pod structure as previously stable groups have started forming smaller factions. Um, and we also have a, a Harbor Wild Watch volunteer, Ellie Sawyer. And uh, <laughs> when she saw that this presentation was on her docket, she said, Monica is one of my favorite whale people ever. Um, so we definitely know this presentation is going to be great. And uh, Oh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> with that, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you, Monica. So. You're welcome to go ahead and share your screen and I'll turn my video off for you and uh, All right. take Is that it away. Okay? You see that okay? All right, good to go. All right, thank you guys so much for hosting me today. Um, they gave me the topic of orca behavior, which is uh, pretty broad, so I'll kind of um, start with some basics about the populations of killer whales that we have here in Puget Sound and uh, do some comparing and contrasting uh, between the two. Um, so for starters, to give you a little bit of background on me, um, as you mentioned, I've been uh, watching killer whales um, in the Salish Sea, especially in the San Juan Islands since the year 2000. And for me, it started when I was a high school student and came up here in the summer on a family vacation and saw the Southern residents on the west side of San Juan Island. And the picture on the left there is um, down on the rocks in front of the Lime Kiln Lighthouse. And uh, that, you know, encounters like that um, were super common um, back at that time in the summer. And it was moments like those that made me immediately fall in love with these killer whales. And I just wanted to know more. Um, know them better, study them, and uh, participate with photography and advocacy and, and all of that sort of thing. So as a high school student, I started as a research intern at the Whale Museum here in Friday Harbor. Um, when I was a college student, I worked as a naturalist in the summers on a whale watch boat out of Friday Harbor. Um, I moved to San Juan Island uh, full-time after graduating from college. 
I've kind of worn uh, several different hats in the whale community with research and education. But my current venture is in 2015, we co-founded um, Institute and we're a nonprofit based on San Juan Island. Um, mission, uh, sorry, I was getting an internet warning here. Hopefully that's still coming. Orca Behavior Institute is to conduct non-invasive behavioral and killer whales of the Salish Sea and beyond. So I'll loop back to that and talk a little bit more will be uh, towards the end of the presentation. But over the last 20 years, here, things have changed so dramatically. Um, in the early 2000s, pretty much all the Southern residents all the time, from May through September, they were here on almost a daily basis, often multiple pods or the entire population together in what we call a super pod. And they would do the, uh, their kind of circuit up to the Fraser River and the West Side Shuffle, we call it, on the west side of San Juan Island, going back and forth right by uh, the Limecone Lighthouse. And um, I was actually here for four summers before I ever saw the other population of killer whales. And those guys, the marine mammal eaters, are called uh, transient killer whales. They're also known as Biggs killer whales. I'll probably uh, use those two terms interchangeably. Um, and Nowadays, uh, things have changed so dramatically where we're actually seeing the Biggs killer whales a lot more than the Southern residents um, in the inland waters of Washington state. Um, so again, I will uh, go into a little more detail about those changing trends later, um, but that picture on the right was actually taken earlier this year. Um, and we're now having these amazing shore-based encounters on San Juan Island with Biggs killer whales, which was um, practically unheard of 20 years ago. And um, I'm actually in both those photos, always kind of as close to the water as I can get right up front, uh, taking photos and now collecting data as well. Um, but it's just been an amazing transformation how things have shifted kind of from the Southern resident killer whales to the Biggs killer whales, um, all just right here um, from San Juan Island. So killer whales um, as a species are one of the most widespread animals on the planet. They're found in every ocean of the world. And they're, everywhere you find them though, they're in these unique populations called ecotypes that have their own culture, their own behaviors, they're feeding on different things and everything about their social structure and behavior is completely different. So uh, the species or sinus orca, they're all still technically considered killer whales or orcas, the same species, but it's recognized by scientists as a species complex, meaning that there's kind of active speciation speciation happening and um, probably multiple species already exist, but it's just not clear kind of where that division between different ecotypes is. Um, what's going on here? Pausing my screen sharing, I'll try and go on here. There we go. Um, so killer whales throughout the world um, are starting to genetically diverge from one another. So over the last uh, several hundred million years from kind of the ancestral killer whale, they've diverged into all these different ecotypes worldwide. And so what you're seeing here is the sort of relative relationship between these different populations. And the branches that occur further back um, are populations that diverged uh, longer ago. And then um, the ones that are near present day are more recent. Um, splits. And what's really interesting with the resident and transient killer whales that we have here is that they're in the same geographic area, but they're actually among the most genetically distinct killer whale populations in the world. So even though they're living in the same place, you might suspect initially that they may have diverged from one another really recently. Um, but these guys have not um, interbred with one another um, for many millions of years. So or, um, uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so it's it's a unique situation that we have here with these uh, two populations of killer whales that um, their habitat and their range actually completely overlaps with one another. So here um, on the west side of North America, we have the southern resident population that kind of ranges from uh, central BC down to central California. And then the transient killer whale population, which roams um, from uh, Southeast Alaska down to Southern California. 
So again, completely overlapping, but completely different populations of killer whales that don't interact or interbreed with one another at all, which is a pretty unique situation to find in nature. So when we're talking about these different ecotypes or different populations of killer whales, what does that really mean? Um, there are some similarities and, and differences. Um, as I mentioned, they're all considered or sinus orca for now. So they're all considered killer whales, members of the same species. Um, with our two populations here, they live in the same area. Um, and then they're also given um, alphanumeric designations. So killer whales can be individually identified um, by the size and shape of their dorsal fin and the gray marking that sits behind their fin called a saddle patch that's unique on every single whale. And so we have these uh, big photo ID catalogs of the killer whale populations and we can recognize not only which population we're seeing but which individual whale we're seeing. So among the Southern residents, we have J-pod, K-pod and L-pod and uh, every individual whale is given an alphanumeric indicating which pod they're from and then the number in which they were identified into that pod. So we have J1, the first whale identified in J-pod, J2, J3, same thing in K-pod and L-pod as well. And then the transients have uh, all been given a T designation. So we have T1, T2, T3, and so on. So we kind of classify and follow the killer whales in the same way. They look more or less the same, um, but beyond that, uh, they're actually quite different from one another. So uh, the, there are some subtle differences in morphology. Uh, the transient or Biggs killer whales are much larger than the southern residents. Um, there's a little bit of different shapes to their uh, dorsal fin. They tend to be more triangular. Um, they tend to have just solid saddle patches, whereas you can see in the upper right, a southern residents sometimes have open saddle patches that kind of look checkmark shaped. Um, but overall, they have the same coloration. Um, and then the other differences, we talked a little bit about genetics, but we're going to kind of go through these others here as we uh, compare the two populations that both live here in the Salish Sea. And the primary difference um, between the southern residents and the transient killer whales comes down to their diet. Um, the transient killer whales are the marine mammal predators. And you can see here that their uh, main prey items are uh, harbor seals, harbor porpoise, stellar sea lions, and dolls porpoise. And those four species make up um, more than 90% of their diet. And this uh, data comes from a study that looked at the population across their whole range from Alaska to California. But we've done um, similar comparison here in the Salish Sea. So when the whales are just in uh, Washington waters here, and um, we found that these percentages hold up pretty similar. So more than half of what they're eating is harbor seals. And then um, the other species kind of fall into place after that. Um, they do occasionally take baleen whales, such as minke whales. But in general, um, this population is feeding on the smaller marine mammals. And there's a different outer coastal population um, that will feed on the gray whales during migration and, and things like that. So there's um, sort of the Biggs killer whale population, I should mention, is kind of subdivided into these um, inner coastal and outer coastal uh, populations. And the inner coastal population, the ones that come into the inland waters and are seen um, you know, near shore more often, is a population that currently numbers about uh, 350 individuals. And contrast that with the southern residents, the three pods that I mentioned, J pod, K pod, and L pod. Um, you know, currently there's just um, a 70 some individuals in the population. It's thought that historically they used to be much larger, but overall it's a smaller population. And these guys are the fish eaters and um, they're not just eating all the fish that are out there. They're very picky eaters. And um, this chart is showing their diet um, for the months of May through September. And you can see that Chinook salmon uh, dominates what they're eating and that holds up for the rest of the year as well though as we shift into the kind of the fall and winter months uh, chum salmon does make up a larger portion of their diet um, they tend to head down into Puget Sound uh, this time of year kind of October through December pretty commonly and they're going after those uh, chum salmon runs um, but overall they're um, focusing on Chinook and Salmonids in general so more than 95% of their diet is made up of Salmonids and it's thought that uh, more than 70% of their diet year round is Chinook. And this difference between what they're eating 
um, allows these two populations to coexist in the same habitat because they're not competing for resources. Um, but what's really interesting as we continue to talk about these two populations is how everything else that's different between them kind of comes back to this topic of prey. So let's talk for a moment about acoustics. That's kind of uh, my first introduction into killer whale research uh, came through acoustics and my undergraduate thesis at uh, Reed College was about the shifting repertoires of a southern resident killer whale uh, vocal communication. So killer whales make three uh, different types of vocalizations. They make echolocation clicks, which they use to navigate and forage. They make uh, whistles, which sound a lot like human whistles and are part of their social communication. But unlike with um, most of the dolphins, whistles are not their primary social vocalization. Instead, they have uh, what we call discrete calls, which are stereotyped vocalizations about one to two seconds long that are unique in structure and uh, stable over time. And among the Southern residents, their population has about 25 to 30 different discrete call types and subtypes, while the transient uh, killer whale population has just eight discrete call types um, shared across their entire population. And not only are the vocalizations that they use completely different from one another, but the way that they vocalize and how often they vocalize is very different as well. The Southern residents are known for being an extremely chatty population. They're vocal probably 80% of the time. If you drop a hydrophone in, you're very likely to hear them vocalizing. And one of the reasons for that is because they can afford to be. They travel in these large groups that are pursuing salmon. They might all be spread out across the strait and they wanna keep in touch with one another and make sure they're all traveling in the same direction, engaging in the same activity. And the fact that they're very vocal doesn't affect their prey. The salmon don't respond to the fact that the killer whales are vocalizing. So it doesn't cost them anything in terms of lost uh, foraging um, to be really vocal. Uh, but the transient killer whales, on the other hand, um, eating marine mammals, uh, a species like a harbor seal is very aware of their acoustic environment. And if they hear a transient killer whale, they're gonna get out of there. Um, so the vast majority of the time, transient killer whales are silent. Um, they're kind of very stealthy as they move through their habitat and they kind of skulk in and out of uh, these rocky shorelines and into little coves and inlets. And uh, they're kind of detecting their prey uh, passively by uh, listening for them. So they tend to be vocal right after they've made a kill when they already have something to eat. They'll um, be vocal at that point in time or when they get together into these kind of highly social groups. Um, but lately, as we've had more and more of the transient killer whales coming into the area, uh, hearing them has become a, a lot more common as well over some of the streaming hydrophones in the area. So I want to play a couple of uh, call samples for you here. Um, first is a sample of the transient killer whale discrete calls, um, which I will say have a very kind of eerie sort of vibrato quality to them. And the Southern residents, by contrast, sound uh, very different. And I'll play a clip of that for you here. The Southern residents tend to be a lot more vocal. There's a lot of different types of vocalizations going on and um, you're much more likely to hear them. And we can determine which population is present not only visually by photo identifying individuals, but also acoustically by these types of vocalizations that they make. And I mentioned that not only is their vocal behavior different, um, but how they move through their habitat is different as well. So here's a, a map of the Salish Sea and uh, a couple um, examples here. So this is uh, data from this summer 
And J-Pod in July um, spent quite a bit of time here um, in and around the Samhain Islands. And this is kind of what they do. They come in, they make a circuit uh, up to the Fraser River um, near Vancouver, BC. Then they come back down around the, to the west side of Samhain Island and they tend to stick to these larger open waterways. Their travel patterns are much more predictable. They kind of head in a straight line from point A to point B. And they kind of repeat the same um, general travel pattern. They have a few different routes that they take, but they'll um, make the trip up to the Fraser River, head back down to San Juan Island, maybe forage out of the banks and do the west side shuffle and then head back up to the Fraser again. Whereas the Bix killer whales, um, as I, as I said before, kind of going into every little channel, every small straight cove inlet and looking for the next harbor seal haul out and kind of exploring the entire habitat in a much different way. So the T65Bs is one small family group that spent uh, several weeks in the Salish Sea this summer. And here's kind of what they did as they moved through the habitat. So uh, went down into San Saanich Inlet, um, came up from Nanaimo, back down through the middle of the San Juan Islands, um, out west towards Victoria and out to the banks, uh, up to Trinco Mali Channel, and just kind of circling around and going into all these different waterways. So the location that you see the whales and how they're moving through their habitat is very different between the two populations as well. Now, killer whales are uh, very long lived. They have a lifespan and development very similar to humans. Um, you know, they're born and they're nursing for the first couple years. Um, they're considered juveniles until about age uh, 10 or 12, and they begin to reach sexual maturity. Uh, but they're not considered fully adults until they reach their full adult size at about 18 or 20 years old. Then the 20s, 30s, and 40s are kind of the prime breeding years for the females. Um, females then go through menopause and have an extended post-reproductive life period, um, living up to their 80s, 90s, possibly even over 100 years old. And uh, killer whales are also matrilineal, and this is something that occurs across the ecotypes where um, offspring of both genders will stay with their mother in their mother's kind of immediate family group. But among southern residents, those bonds are lifelong. We don't see any dispersal of either male or female offspring from the maternal group. And again, this is something that historically they could afford to do because there's abundant food, abundant salmon. They could be in groups of 20, 30, 40 whales and find enough to eat. So here's uh, one of the family groups in LPOD, the L4s. And if you encountered this group, you would see all of these whales traveling together and they would be staying together throughout their entire life. Um, in the Biggs killer whale population, here's another family tree showing the T46 family. You know, if these were Southern residents, you would expect to see all these 20 some whales traveling together. But what the Biggs killer whales do is very different. They sort of divide into smaller groups and that again comes back to the prey where if you're hunting something like a harbor seal or a porpoise, if you have too many whales around, uh, you're more likely to be detected by your prey and be less successful in hunting. So their optimal group size is like between three and six whales in sort of an immediate unit that travels together. So this family group has split into all these different subgroups that travel uh, separately from one another. And they do occasionally come back together but in general, you might see just five of these whales, three of these whales, four of these whales together. <clears throat> Some of them even split off as individuals at time. So here you have um, you know, an entire match line that might be traveling in five or six different groups, which is very different than what you see with the Southern resident killer whales. And I mentioned how these whales are, uh, the transients are spending so much more time in the Salish Sea um, in recent years. For the Southern residents, um, you know, studies kind of first began in the 1970s and the same whales are returning to these same waterways year after year. And as a result, not only do we have these family trees um, where we know kind of the individual and fam family history of, um, of all the whales in the population, but we really get to know them as individuals as well. And now that the big killer whales are spending so much more time here, we're getting that same opportunity with them. And uh, because they're lesser known, I always like to kind of point out a few uh, stories to show that 
Um, these guys are, are very different, but they're very amazing in their own right as a population of killer whales. And it's been um, really special to get to know them better in more recent years. So just a couple examples, just from this uh, single family is uh, back in 2011, um, T123 and her son T123A actually live stranded at a low tide and uh, up near Prince Rupert in central BC. Um, they were you know, kept wet and everything during the low tide. And when the tide came back in, they refloated and um, you know, were just fine. And uh, what's really amazing is that uh, T123C, the next offspring of uh, T123 Sydney, um, she was actually pregnant with her during this time. So uh, her daughter's name is Lucky for having uh, survived this, um, you know, when her mother was pregnant with her in the live stranding. Um, so pretty amazing that uh, they, they made it through this and, and those whales are still going strong today. Um, Another unusual one is T46C2, a whale known as Sam, who in 2013, um, at just a few years old, had dispersed um, from her family group. And usually when dispersal happens, it's for uh, females. Once they start having their own offspring, they might break off from their maternal group. Um, adult males, again, once they reach adulthood, if there's a lot of, uh, a lot of whales in the family group, they might split off on their own for a while. Um, but this was a very young whale that uh, split off at just uh, four or five years old. And, you know, there were some concerns about it at the beginning when it was seen all by itself, um, again, in, in an inlet in BC. Uh, but over time, it's associated with other whales. It seems to be feeding itself. It's occasionally back with its family, but not always. Um, so again, just, you know, kind of a, a bizarre instance of, of the whales doing something different. And it's something that I always say uh, about killer whale behavior is as soon as we think we've learned something, uh, there's an exception to the rule. And uh, Sam was one of those whales where we say they don't disperse as juveniles and uh, she did. And then uh, a whale you may have heard about in the news, um, Toluk, who is our uh, white killer whale um, <clears throat> that is seen frequently in the Sailor Sea here. And it's thought to be um, some kind of genetic mutation. Um, he is not an albino uh, per se. Um, and so we don't know exactly uh, you know, what syndrome it is that he has. Um, in some cases, uh, these can have, um, you know, not just pigmentation uh, mutations, but there could be some um, immune system issues and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so we're hopeful that, that he survives, but so far he seems very healthy. He's actually um, getting a really beautiful kind of gradient color on him right now. He has sort of more black appearing on his face and um, really uh, keen to watch him grow up as well. He's a very beautiful whale. So um, again, we're getting to know uh, the Biggs killer whale population a lot better as well, and all of their individual stories. So we're, we're so lucky to have these uh, two populations of killer whales here, um, not only because they're amazing in their own right, but they allow us this incredible ability to kind of compare and contrast what's the same and what's different, especially with one, the southern residents being an, an endangered population. Um, so here, this is looking back at the last 15 years, um, April through September, kind of what used to be the core months for the Southern residents in the Sailor Sea. And you can see that they were here, um, you know, well over 100 days during that time period. And if you, if you extended this graph back even further into the late 90s, you know, it was almost daily um, in the months of April through September that they were here. And Meanwhile, you know, the Biggs killer whales back in the early 2000s, they were here maybe 30 days um, throughout that entire summer period. You know, they were very rarely encountered by comparison. But all of a sudden, about 10 years ago, this huge switch started happening where the southern residents were here less and less in what was considered their core habitat. And the Biggs killer whales just took off like crazy and we started seeing them more and more. And now you can see they're here themselves almost every single day in, in the summertime. So, um, so what's, what's going on with that? Well, again, just like the differences in behavior, um, the differences in their presence, again, comes down to prey. So this is looking at occurrences of Biggs killer whales, which means um, not just the number of sightings, but kind of the number of unique sightings. It's a metric that's been used in these three different um, 
publications that occurred over three different seven year periods dating from the late 80s up to 2017. And you can see that it captures the same trend that was on that uh, previous chart showing this rise in the presence of big killer whales in the Salish Sea. And uh, for comparison from WDFW data, here's harbor porpoise population. And you can see it follows a very similar trajectory that um, in the 60s and 70s, um, a lot of marine mammal populations experienced big declines um, in, in Washington and in the inland waters in general. And since then, since the passing of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, a lot of those populations of pinnipeds and porpoises have really recovered. And so it's not a big surprise that as those numbers have gone back up, the big killer whales have kind of realized where they can feast and they've moved back into the Salish Sea. Now looking at the southern residents and their um, salmon prey, specifically looking at Chinook salmon on the Fraser River, which is the largest river system in the Salish Sea. And it's the uh, spring, summer, and fall runs of Chinook that uh, were, you know, the reason for the big presence of the southern residents in kind of those summer months. And there's a test catch fishery um, near the mouth of the Fraser River where they have this uh, long-term study where they're catching, you know, doing test catches at uh, every day throughout the summer season, and they can kind of uh, track salmon numbers over time. And what we've seen from that data is, you know, numbers are lower earlier in the season and salmon numbers would kind of rise as it goes on, but we sort of lost the salmon in April and in May originally. Then the June numbers started to drop off for salmon returning to the Fraser River, followed by July dropping off. And now August is beginning to drop off as well. And so it's no surprise you overlay the presence of the southern residents over that and as the prey has diminished their presence here has diminished as well so they've had to go elsewhere to look for food. So again you have one habitat here in the Salish Sea, you have these two populations of killer whales in the bigs and the southern residents. And you have one population that is spending a lot less time here and another population that's spending a lot more time here. And it's not just their presence that's changed, but the size of the population as well. So over the last 20 years, the Southern resident population has experienced a pretty steady decline from uh, almost 100 whales to down into the low 70s. Uh, whereas the bigs population has been growing steadily over that same time period. So the Southern residents um, were listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act in 2005. And with that listing uh, came the identification of three risk factors um, that were the primary contributors um, to you know, their decline and potential obstacles to their recovery. Um, contaminants is one of those concerns. And it's a lot of uh, kind of bioaccumulating, biomagnifying chemicals like PCBs and PBDEs that sort of um, the higher up on the food chain that you are, um, the more of these toxins are being carried in your system. And those toxins can affect um, you know, your immune system, your fertility, your overall health and well-being. And it's, it's especially the case um, when you're not getting enough to eat that you start metabolizing these fatty toxins that are stored in your blubber and they begin to sort of compound the fact that you're not getting enough to eat by introducing these other health impacts. And you can see in that little food web that the big killer whales are actually one trophic level higher above the southern resident killer whales because they're not just feeding on fish, they're feeding on the mammals that feed on the fish. So the big killer whales are actually carrying even higher toxin loads than the southern residents, yet their population is increasing because they have enough to eat, so those toxins have less of an impact on them. Similarly, uh, vessel effects is the, the second risk factor. And there's concerns about underwater noise um, from you know, recreational and commercial whale watching, but also uh, most of the underwater soundscape here is dominated by commercial shipping traffic, ferries. Um, there's concerns about military exercises and you know, sonar testing. And again, uh, both these populations are exposed to the same vessels in the same underwater acoustic environment. Um, but the impacts of that vessel noise will, you know, will differ depending on um, how much you have to eat. If you have harbor seal around every corner, it doesn't matter so much if your environment is noisy or if it's quiet. 
Whereas if you're uh, looking for salmon that are becoming more and more scarce, that underwater noise starts to have a bigger masking impact because you have a louder environment and fewer fish and you're having a harder time finding the fish that are present as a result. Um, and then of course, prey and specifically the decline in abundance of Chinook salmon is uh, by far the most uh, significant risk factor that's impacting the Southern resident population. Um, not only impacting their presence here in the Salish Sea, but uh, their overall ability uh, to survive and reproduce as well. So um, again, I just, I can't stress enough how incredible it is that we have these two populations here that we can compare directly. And the fact that the big killer whales are thriving can tell us so much about why the Southern residents are not. And the prey issue um, doesn't just affect you know, how, how long an individual whale can stay fit and stay healthy, but it's really severely impacting their ability to give birth. So T37A is a young mother, um, transient killer whale, and by the age of 25, she has had five successful offspring. You can see in recent years, um, you know, she's uh, at times giving birth just two years apart, these whales have an 18 month gestation period and then they're nursing for one to two years after that. So these female transient killer whale mothers are so robust that they can handle the metabolic toll of carrying a pregnancy to term and nursing a calf as well as provisioning their other juvenile offspring because there's just so much food that they're healthy, they can feed everybody no problem and they're just producing calves like crazy. Whereas the Southern residents are uh, are getting pregnant, which is the good news. They're not, you know, they haven't experienced a loss of fertility, but they're not successfully carrying calves to term. And uh, J31, another young mother, but from JPOD, uh, was known to have um, at least seven attempted pregnancies before she had her first successful birth. And thanks to um, both photogrammetry data, where they fly a drone above the whales to assess body condition, as well as uh, hormonal data taken from fecal samples from the whales, they've been able to start tracking pregnancies in southern residents. So we know if a whale is seen pregnant, but never is seen with a viable calf that uh, she must have miscarried or aborted that pregnancy. Um, and so it's just a, a tragic story with J31 who lost so many pregnancies. She was seen in, um, in 2004, uh, early 2015 as well with a stillborn calf until finally um, she had her first successful calf in, in J56. So again, the prey is explaining um, these, these different trends that we're seeing in birth rates. And in the big killer whale population, it's just incredible. The, the population has been growing about 4% per year. And there's hardly any family groups that don't have a calf under the age of two. So almost any group of big killer whales you encounter will have one of these, uh, you know, one or several little calves traveling with them. Whereas the Southern residents um, are going periods at times of two or three years without a single birth into the entire population. And again, if you compare these two populations in recent years, uh, the Southern residents are much smaller. The big killer whale population is about four times the size of the Southern resident population. But you look from 2012 to 2019, and the number of deaths between the two populations is pretty similar, even though uh, the number of big killer whales overall is so much higher. But what's even more striking is the birth rate over that time period. You can see just a small number of successful births among the Southern residents over those seven or eight years, and more than 120 births into the uh, transient killer whale population in that time. And over a period of five years, there were as many big killer whale calves born that survived as there are Southern resident killer whales. So the striking comparison between these two populations is just, just incredible. And it's amazing to see these whales in the same habitat, one thriving and one really struggling to survive. So what can be done? Um, there's there's those three risk factors and um, vessel effects is sort of seen as, as one that we can tackle most easily. It's something that can um, have an immediate impact. And there's been a lot of discussion um, since the endangered listing of the Southern residents about how we can mitigate vessel effects. And there's been the, uh, several rulemaking processes that have uh, further regulated um, 
how close you can get to the whales, how fast you can travel when you're in a vessel near the whales. Um, and that applies to both uh, commercial and recreational whale watching. And really uh, what whale watching looks like now is very, very different than what it looked like 15 or 20 years ago. And so even though it continues to be talked about, um, me personally, I feel like we have, we've addressed that issue in a lot of ways and it's time to move on uh, to some of these others that are more difficult, but, but more important for the long-term uh, health of the Southern residents. Um, contaminants obviously is a very, very long-term um, issue. It, you know, it takes decades at least for some of these toxins to kind of work their way out of the environment. Um, things like PCB levels, you know, that were regulated starting in the 1970s, um, those, the amount of toxins that the whales are carrying of, of PCBs is, has gone down. Um, there's been a lot of uh, regulation on the flame retardant chemicals, PBDEs, which is another big one that's impacting them. There's been a lot of recent legislation about stormwater runoff into Puget Sound. And all of these things are super important and will long term have impacts on the health, not only for the southern residents, but of the Sailor Sea as a whole. But again, it all comes back to salmon and, and everyone agrees that salmon is the most important risk um, that these whales face. And if they don't get enough to eat, um, they're not going to make it even if the water is completely clean and completely quiet. Um, but it's also the toughest of the three to address. Um, salmon management is very complex. You have many different entities involved. Um, these are fish that travel from freshwater streams that are often very far inland down through, in many cases, like the Fraser River, um, big cities like, like Vancouver, BC. They're going out into the open ocean. They're you know, transiting between United States and Canada. Um, and so they're going through all these habitats, all these political boundaries, and it's not, it's not simple. Um, if it were easy to recover wild salmon, we would have done it by now. Um, but we can do it. It just, it's gonna take a lot um, of difficult conversations and difficult decisions to figure out um, how do we prioritize wild salmon recovery and, and what sacrifices do we need to make to make that happen. And uh, a couple of the, the big ticket items are, are listed there. Um, breaching the four dams on the lower Snake River is a major topic of conversation because when the Southern residents are not in the Salish Sea and not relying on Fraser River fish, uh, fish returning to the Columbia and Snake River Basin are hugely important to them when they're on the outer coast. Um, putting in uh, a seat at the table for the Southern residents when it comes to fisheries management is another really important one. When we're kind of dividing up how many fish go where, there's a, a new movement trying to advocate for a fisheries quota for the Southern residents. So we sort of uh, set aside a piece of the pie specifically for them. And again, that, you know, that has to go through many levels of, of fisheries management to get something like that to happen. Um, removing uh, fish farms out of British Columbia that have huge health impacts on wild salmon runs, and then a whole slew of, of issues related to habitat restoration, especially as spawning uh, grounds for a Chinook salmon coast-wide um, you know, development and logging and agricultural runoff and, you know, the dams are, are a piece of that, smaller dams throughout the region. Um, there's so much to be done. And um, the, the good news is that uh, a lot of these conversations are happening, especially in recent years. We had the ORCA task force here in Washington um, that pushed a lot of important legislation and, and other recovery actions forward. Um, but again, it's, it, it's not quite enough yet. Um, there has to you know, continue to be conversations and we need to um, really put the salmon issues at the forefront because we need to start uh, addressing these now um, because they will also take some time to really you know, have an impact and let the salmon populations recover to allow the Southern residents to recover as well. But speaking of that good news, um, we did have two new Southern resident calves um, born in September. We had uh, J57 born to J35 Tahlequah, who's the, um, the mother who carried her deceased calf um, for 17 days back in 2018. So her next pregnancy was successful. And then uh, just a couple weeks later, J58 born to J41 Eclipse, also in J-Pod. Um, and so what these, what these whales are showing us, which, which they did in 2015, 2016 as well, when we had a, a baby boom, 
is that when they do get enough to eat, they can successfully carry pregnancies to term and have viable offspring. And uh, the baby boom in 2015 and 16 was correlated um, with kind of a, an artificial spike in salmon um, due to hatcheries and uh, hatchery management. And all of a sudden, once they got enough to eat for a couple of years, we had uh, something like 11 births into the population in 13 months. Um, so the good news is they're, you know, they're fertile, they're capable of carrying pregnancies to term, and we, we just need to give them the chance to do so by making sure that they get enough to eat. Um, one thing I didn't mention on that previous slide about all the aborted um, and miscarried pregnancies that have been happening in the southern resident population is that um, those aborted pregnancies are directly correlated to body condition of the mother. So if she's in poor nutritional condition, she aborts the pregnancy, makes sense. Um, she you know, doesn't have um, enough nutrition to support both her and the calf. But when the mothers are robust, when they're well fed, they can successfully have these calves. And, and that's what we wanna see more of. Um, you may have seen on social media that uh, J46, who's another young whale, would be a first time mother, um, is also very pregnant um, based on uh, photos from when they were down in Puget Sound just a few days ago. So we're hopeful that there might even be uh, more calves to come in the very near future for the Southern residents. So, Looping all this kind of back uh, to the Orca Behavior Institute and, and what we do, um, it was these dramatic shifts in habitat usage by both the Southern residents and the big killer whales that kind of motivated us to, to form our group. And we wanted to put some data behind these sort of anecdotal trends that everybody who's here watching whales had kind of noticed, but it hadn't really been documented in the literature. And that includes sort of the presence and the abundance changes that, that I've talked about tonight, but also um, the Southern residents are fractioning into smaller groups. You know, you, you don't necessarily see all of J-Pod traveling together anymore. They'll sometimes be in smaller groups as they search for more limited prey. And um, their behavior when they're present here as well is, um, is potentially shifting where um, when they are here, they're spending different amounts of time, you know, foraging, resting, socializing, and traveling. So what we do at the Orca Behavior Institute um, is research primarily. We're out in the field um, collecting behavioral data on both populations of killer whales to do some behavioral budget assessments and track some of these behavioral and social association changes over time. We also collaborate with a lot of partners in the region to track presence of killer whales throughout the entire Salish Sea and uh, track these sort of habitat usage changes um, that, that I've talked about tonight. Um, we have, of course, an education component giving talks like this one, and um, we also work with student interns. Uh, we mentor a lot of uh, college students working on different research projects relating to our data and that sort of thing. And then advocacy as well. Um, you can't be involved with killer whales here without uh, being a voice for them with all the important uh, discussions and rulemaking uh, that's going on, legislation. Um, so we're really taking um, not only our data, but our long-term observations over time um, to the policymakers and to the different interest groups and stakeholders and saying, hey, this is what's going on with these whales and this is why we're seeing what we're seeing. So definitely want to encourage you, if you don't already, um, to follow us on social media. Um, you can see we're on Facebook, Instagram. Um, we started a couple of uh, YouTube video series this year. And then we also post a lot of uh, acoustic recordings on our, our SoundCloud as well. So um, there's lots of ways uh, to engage with us and uh, try to be very active on social media, not only about uh, current events and sharing, you know, photos and videos of, of our whale encounters and what we've seen and sort of the news um, on births and that, and that kind of thing. Um, but also kind of uh, debriefing, you know, a lot of the science and, and that sort of thing as it comes out. Um, we spend a lot of time taking some of these technical reports and trying to kind of parse them down into more um, digestible terms. So uh, to really encourage public engagement um, whenever these public comment opportunities and, and everything are possible. Um, so definitely check us out. And then I, um, if you're interested in learning more about killer whales, I also have to give a little plug uh, for my book, Endangered Orcas, The Story of the Southern Residents, um, came out last year in 2019. 
And I was kind of amazed when I, when I started watching the Southern Residents 20 years ago that there wasn't um, a dedicated book sort of, sort of about their story. And I finally decided um, I needed to write that book myself. So um, if you're interested in sort of their story and, and how we got here into this situation and um, how our relationship to the Southern Residents has changed over time and kind of where we need to go from here to ensure their recovery, um, uh, it's a, a, a book that I'll hope that you will check out. And um, with that, I've kind of come to the end here. I'll turn it over to your questions. Hopefully you guys have some. And uh, thank you again for having me tonight. We'll give the roaring applause from everyone here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Monica. I think in person you were, we would have, yeah, this roaring applause. You're getting a lot of love in the comments there. So um, I know it can be a, a, an interesting time presenting <laughs> to, to your computer and not to a lovely live audience, but we had lots of folks tuning in and they do have a lot of great questions. So um, I'm gonna do my best to go through the ones that I've already written down. And then of course, um, for those of you tuning in, um, if you, you know you're, you have some more wonders or questions, uh, definitely, uh, let us know and I'll uh, do our best to get to those as well. So thank you so much. Um, I'm also kind of bummed we can't like do autographs of your books right now like that. I could see being a quite a hit. So um, we'll, we'll have to do another one of these in person. <laughs> yeah, let's put it on the on the calendar for sure. Um, so my first question was from Joe. And he's wondering if all of the ORCA communications are audible or above the audible range, which... Yeah, I'm assuming uh, the human audible range. And uh, that's, you know, it's a great question. And killer whales can hear frequencies much, much higher than humans can, but the primary range of their vocalizations is right within the realm of human hearing. So kind of from maybe two kilohertz up to about 15 kilohertz is where most of those discrete calls occur. Um, so we can hear all of their social vocalizations without modifying the recordings at all. They're right within the range of human hearing. My question was going to be, if you're watching Free Willy, are you able to be like, oh my gosh, that's a transient whale or a resident orca? Like, are you able to tell the difference? Of yes, and uh, I, won't, I won't ruin the magic by saying where they got things wrong, but... <laughs> But uh, J-Pod is featured in the in the Free Willy movies and in the Southern Residence in those opening wild veil scenes that, that is our Southern Residence. That's awesome. Uh, Lori is wondering, how do the Northern Residence sound in comparison to the Southern Residence, which I think, maybe I wrote that question down wrong. I'm going to reread Lori's question later. Let me uh, <laughs> pop over to Peters. Um, he's wondering if um, kind of between the 25 to 30 calls of the residents, are they able to share those between the JK and L pods? Or are they distinct between pod or like per pod yeah. or can the pods yeah. talk to each other? Same for the eight um, of the transients. Yeah, great question. So among the Southern residents, you know, there's 25 or so discrete call types for the entire population. And some of those are distinct to specific pods and some of them are shared vocalizations across the pods. So um, each pod has a pod specific repertoire made up of a subset of those, you know, 25 to 30 call types. So tuning into the hydrophone, we can, um, you know, determine not only whether we're hearing residents or transients, but even which pods are present based on those vocalizations. So um, it's sort of thought that the differences in vocalization are kind of a badge of social identity. Um, so they sort of indicate, you know, who you are and, and which family group you're part of, um, as well as which population you're part of. Um, with the, the big killer whales, their vocalizations have been um, not studied in quite as much detail, but it seems like those eight call types are shared across the entire population. Awesome. So then uh, rereading Lori's question, she, yeah, I think that answers whether like between the northern residents and the southern residents. If those yeah, so there's uh, there's another population of, of resident fish eating killer whales uh, further off the north end of Vancouver Island, and uh, they do sound completely different from both the southern residents and the transients. So 
Um, it's not only the ecotypes that sound different, but the different populations as well. So um, there's Southern residents, Northern residents, you know, Alaska residents, and they're all fish eating killer whales, but they're all distinct populations. Again, don't interact, don't socialize with one another and their vocalizations are completely different. Very cool. What a fun, fun thing to know. <laughs> um, Eileen has a great question. Um, she's wondering, will the Southern residents not alter their diet? Uh, what would it take for them to make that adaptation? Like, can you just like accidentally buy a harbor seal already and notice that they're a delicious mammal and you should eat them and get all sorts of energy? Like, what's the deal? I know. I know. Like, when you think about it from just a logical perspective, you're like, there's so many seals and sea lions and porpoises. <laughs> here. Why won't they just change what they're eating? And there's sort of this myth out there that they can't, you know, that eat marine mammals. Like maybe they're, you know, there's something physiological about them. They're not big enough or strong enough. And, and that's just not true. Um, we do see Southern residents sometimes harassing and sometimes killing marine mammals. Um, they have a weird game that they play where they kind of harass um, young porpoises and sometimes kill them, but they never have been seen to consume them. And the best answer that I have for this is well, it, it makes sense to us, like, why don't just change what you're eating, like, figure it out. But asking them to change what they're eating is sort of asking them to change everything about who they are and how they've evolved to be resident killer whales. Because as I talked about, you know, their, their whole family structure and the fact that they can be together in these large social vocal groups and the way they move through their environment, it all comes down to what they're feeding on. And if we asked them to switch and start eating marine mammals, the families would have to split up. They would have to be quiet. They would have to travel in different places. Um, it's like, you know, it's asking them to change everything that's fundamental about what it is to be a resident killer whale. And it's apparently a sacrifice that they're, that they're not willing to make, that they, they co-evolved with these incredibly abundant salmon in the region and everything about how they live their lives is related to those salmon. And, um, you know, rather than asking them to change to the environment that we've modified, we really need to be asking ourselves, what do we do to get these whales the salmon that they deserve? Yeah, for those of you with a cocktail out there, I think a hearty cheers to that. <laughs> uh, Carly has two questions. Um, she's wondering, where can we get your book? And if you had to choose one, what is your favorite part of your totally awesome sounding research? <laughs> um, uh, my book is available both on Amazon and also on IndieBound.org, so you can order it uh, directly to your local bookstore. Um, and my favorite part of my research, it's, man, that's, I mean, obviously being out there and being with the whales is, is the initial motivation that, that started all of this. Um, and I think just, it's, you know, it's an honor and I don't take it for granted the fact that I get to spend so much time with these whales and get to know them as family groups and individuals. And uh, it's been incredible, you know, in the last 10 years to get to know this entirely new population, um, new to me, of uh, the transient killer whales. And you know, sometimes people ask the question like, well, there's, there's still killer whales in the Salish Sea, so who cares? Like, you know, if we lose the Southern residents, we're not, we're not losing a species. Um, there are killer whales here and maybe they're just kind of doomed to extinction. And as much as I love uh, the transient killer whales, they're, they're no replacement for the Southern residents. And when, when you see them, you know, in the field, there's such a different energy between the two populations. And you know, on the surface, they may, they may look the same when you're looking at a picture of a resident and transient, but everything about them and, and the way they move through their environment and the way they carry themselves is so different. And uh, you know, being, being somebody who's gotten to experience that is, is the most incredible thing so that I can you know, come and share those experiences and, and hopefully really let people know that, hey, these, these Southern residents are, are something special. Um, the reason that they were listed as endangered is because they were designated a distinct population segment as being a culturally unique population of killer whales um, that is not replaceable. And um, 
yeah, it's, uh, I, as I said, I think just, just being out there and being able to experience them and, and study them is, is incredible and not something I take for granted at all. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, and I know there's definitely been a big shift in more land-based viewing of orcas. And I think, I mean, yeah, just what a, what a cool thing that you get to get to see them so often. And so maybe a good question is if we wanted to see some resident orcas more specifically, sounds like we need to plan a trip up to the San Juans to <laughs> get on their, on their route. Is that like um, what well, would it be? Yeah, what I kind of showed was their um, their typical summer travel pattern is is around the San Juan Islands and making that trip up to the Fraser River. But this time of year, um, they're coming down into Puget Sound, and uh, JPod was down there for for several days uh, last week. Um, so if you're interested in seeing them in Puget Sound, I definitely recommend that you follow Orca Network. Um, they uh, share real time sightings of of uh, killer whale reports in the Salish Sea, um, especially in Puget Sound, they have a great sightings map that shows all the different parks and water access points where you can where you can see the whales. So, and uh, this is the perfect time of year for it. So definitely tune into Orca Network, and um, you can see the southern residents in Puget Sound hopefully in the next uh, couple weeks and months here. Yeah, awesome. I know we're Harbor Wild Watch is definitely gearing up for the return of the salmon. Um, we just got our salmon observation station installed, so. Um, the chum salmon should be back here in kind of November time. So we're looking forward to that. Yep. And uh, the whales should be coming in for the same reason at right about the same time. Yeah. Great. Okay, Rusty has a hard question. Not <laughs> including orcas, what's the coolest whale? Which you might say, well, orcas are actually dolphins or <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> not those sneaky mind blowing things. But yes, what's what's your what's the coolest whale? What do you think? That is, that is a really hard question. Um, I, I don't think I really can choose favorites, but to make it a little easier on myself, I'll say um, the coolest whale here in the Salish Sea, uh, other than the orca, is probably the humpback whale. That has been um, another incredible example of the rapidly shifting ecosystem um, over the last 20 years is, you know, we went uh, many decades without humpbacks in the Salish Sea after they were kind of hunted uh, out of this area. And they've, you know, recovered uh, with the, you know, uh, with whale, they end up whaling and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And as their population has recovered, they've sort of recolonized the Salish Sea. And there's just this incredible population of now a couple hundred humpback whales that, that utilizes this area. And there are um, other whales that we're now getting to know as individuals as they as they come back as well. So um, Puget Sound and Washington is kind of known for the killer whales, but uh, the humpback whales are, have definitely made a huge comeback. And uh, so they get my vote for coolest whale. Or, or the whaley coolest, I don't know. The whaley coolest. Sorry, sorry, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing if there's any other last questions questions which I'll give you a little bit there's definitely a lot more love pouring in um, everyone's saying thank you thank you thank you super informative talk um, I'm wondering if someone made some graphs for you someone was really stoked about the graphs so <laughs> I don't know yay David I, I make my own graphs so. own graphs get it yeah, yeah. um well perfect well I think since I'm not seeing any other questions, I guess, is there any last things you'd like to leave us with before we log off the live feed for Facebook? I don't think so. Just uh, thanks again for having me. This was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, let's definitely do another one in person when uh, times allow. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you everyone out there for tuning in. Hopefully um, you can come for our last Cocktails and Fishtails of 2020 the third Wednesday of the month, six o'clock, we'll be talking microplastics with Julie Macera from UWT, so University of Washington Tacoma. We're looking forward to that. But um, again, Monica, just thank you so, so much. This was such a uh, informative, beautiful talk, and um, there's definitely a lot of good things, big things that I think we can uh, take action on and do to help the orcas, um, AKA help the salmon, <laughs> um, that food yeah. source connection was just mm, solid. So um, yeah, thanks again. And thank you all for tuning in. And um, we will sign off here. And uh, 
this is where okay maybe I don't actually know how to sign up <laughs> one moment <laughs> okay I figured it out all right good night everyone